If you do not know me, my name is Dr. Sari. I'm a senior lecturer in the University of Ghana, Legdon, and also in two other universities in the UK and in South Africa. So to set the stage, I would want to welcome Dr. Gloria. So she's a, a very special person, public health specialist. She's a health mentor. She's a trainer. She's an occupational therapist. She has been the chair of the COVID response team in the university. She's been a member of the UG emergency response team. And when it comes to infectious diseases in this country, she is one of the top people to actually gain enough from. She's a specialist, not just a medical doctor, but a specialist in infectious diseases. So if Dr. Gloransa, you are here, uh, please, you may take over and educate us on HIV AIDS, whether it is a death sentence. Dr. Gloransa. Yes. Hello, good evening to all of us. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about HIV, something I'm very, I'm very passionate about. And I've been working in HIV since 2003. Um, I've learned a lot, I've gained a lot. And therefore, I, I enjoy talking about HIV, HIV AIDS. And this evening we are talking about whether it's a death sentence or not. And we, we, we all have a lot of stories about HIV. I want to start with a few. In fact, if I wanted to talk about, if it comes to stories, I could go on and on and on, but I'll just give one or two. So the first one, I was working in a place and I was on the afternoon shift, I got there. And so I was supposed to um, take over from the one who worked in the morning. And then she left. And when I got in, shortly after they brought, they rushed a, a young lady in her late twenties into, into the consulting room and said that, oh, she had come earlier to come and see the doctor who was there, the, the doctor who was working in the morning, but, um, when she went to sit in the car on her way, she had a seizure, so she had a convulsion and they had to bring her back. And the story was that she had gotten married, had a baby, the baby started falling ill. They went to hospital, they said the baby had HIV, which was very strange. And then, so generally once the baby has, you screen the mom. We screened the mom, the mom was HIV positive. And this was also a shock because she was a virgin before she got married and all those things. So we turned to the, the husband and the husband was positive. And this, this thing had, had done such damage to the, the, the family, you know, because they didn't know, you understand. The second one was a bit, I think two years earlier, previous, prior to this other one. And I was also working in another hospital. We admitted a woman in our, our she was around 75 years old. And we asked her, I mean, she had been unwell and things like that. And we eventually realized it was HIV AIDS. And she was like, oh, my husband died over 10 years ago. So what are you talking about? But that is HIV for you, you know? And, and therefore this evening, it's a pleasure to make a few comments about HIV to help us understand a bit more that it hasn't gone, it's still there, you know? And so the outline of the presentation, just going to talk a bit about what HIV AIDS is, what it means, um, the transmission and the risks, um, how it presents. So when somebody has HIV AIDS, how does it look like? What do they come to? What do they complain of? And then what are the control strategies briefly? And then we'll concentrate a bit more on what has happened over time. So we'll talk about then, and now. So HIV is actually, it, it stands for human immunodeficiency virus. So it's a virus. Now, coronavirus, flu, all those things are viruses. HIV is one of them. And AIDS stands for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. 
acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And so let's go a bit into what HIV is as a virus. You know, so it is a, a virus, what is that is actually, it's something that doesn't live on its own, but it needs yourself and myself to be able to multiply. So on its own outside the body, it can't do anything. Those are that's generally what viruses are. So, but once it gets into the body and then it finds its way into cells, you know, and then multi takes some of the things, components of your cells, and then multiplies itself. And once it multiplies itself, then it breaks down the cell, opens, and then they attack. So if you have, let's say, one virus coming into um, one cell, it will multiply from one virus into thousands, and then it will destroy that particular your cell, and then open up, then spread into your through your blood, and occupy other cells, and then multiply. So that's how it goes on. But then it it's attacks your immune system because the cells that the HIV can grow in are the very cells that protect us. So they destroy your ability to fight diseases, you know. So that's why we say it attacks the immune system and weakens it, you know. So it goes into your cells, multiplies itself, and then breaks out, you know. And so one may go in, thousands may come out, and therefore they will infect thousand other cells. So they are very it could that progression, that multiplication can happen with a very short time and um, cause a lot of the viruses to be multiplied in your system. Then we talk, when we come to AIDS, you know, so usually we talk about HIV AIDS. When we come to AIDS, that is AIDS, um, it develops when the HIV virus has been in your system and has advanced, has damaged your immune system beyond a certain point because it's like once the virus comes in the initial stages, the infection, your body's immune system has some capacity to be able to fight. But with time, as the virus destroys more of your immune system, your capacity to fight back disappears or it depletes. And therefore it gets to a point where your body, your immune system, the viruses overwhelm your body's immune system, basically. And this can take, up to about 10 or 15 years, you know? And in this elderly lady I was talking about, when we asked further, it looked like her husband had died from HIV, you know? And it had taken over 10 years for her to show any symptoms or to develop the HIV. What this means is that, the, the AIDS, what this means is that the HIV virus can be in your system. Nothing will show. And until after many years when you start showing symptoms, you know? So it can take up to 10 to 15 years, you know, and it's usually at the end stage or later stage. So once AIDS sets in, you know that the HIV virus has been in your system for quite a while. There is currently no cure for HIV, but with the right treatment and support, people can live fulfilled and healthy lives, you know. So let's talk a bit about the transmission. How can you get HIV AIDS? You know, there are so many myths and things about it, which, um, and one of the key things that feeds this, the stigma is the lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of how these things happen. The most common methods for transmitting HIV, one is unprotected sex with someone who has HIV already. It doesn't necessarily have to be AIDS. They may not have to have, they don't have to have symptoms, but once the virus in the system, they can spread it. And then sharing needles and with an infected person. So for whatever reason. And then other um, risks that have been reduced over the years is the mother to child, you know, because the child could get it while the woman is pregnant during delivery or even while breastfeeding. So that was another risk, you know, but has been reduced significantly over the years. And then infection through blood and blood products. So some people, some of the very early cases, I think in the Western world, the first recognized case was actually a 10 year old boy who got it through transmission, sorry, transfusion, blood transfusion. All right, so these are the common, common ones. And then other risk factors. So in any community, there are people who are really at a higher risk of acquiring HIV. So people who, for the risk of acquiring HIV, so for people who inject drugs, you know, 
and the exchange um, syringes and injections and things like that, they are 35 times higher, more likely to get it. Their risk is 35 times higher than the ordinary person who doesn't use it, you know. And amongst transgender women, it's 34 times higher. Amongst commercial sex workers, you know, those who sell sex for money, it's 26 times higher than the general population. And then for gay men and other men who have sex with men, it's 25 times higher, you know. So the risk is still there and there are key um, vulnerable populations that have been the target. Now, there are ways in which HIV is not transmitted. You know, these are some of the myths and um, stemmed in fear. So one of the reasons why we are doing this is that once you have knowledge, then it, it, it addresses, it takes away the fear, you know. So the knowledge is like light, you know. Once light comes, darkness disappears, you know. So knowledge provides that insight, you know. So you don't, if somebody has HIV AIDS and you live with them, you don't get it because you share dishes with them. You don't get HIV from saliva. You don't get HIV from getting into contact with somebody's tears, the, the tears of someone who has HIV or their sweat or from shaking hands with someone who has HIV or through the air that just the fact that you are in one room with another person who has HIV doesn't give you HIV. You don't get it from mosquitoes and ticks and other insects or from hugging or from kissing. You know, or sharing toilet facilities. So these are areas that, so one of the key things about, especially about saliva and kissing is that even though the HIV can be detected in saliva, it's been realized that from research that there are some components in the saliva that prevents HIV transmission, even though it may be there. So that is why HIV cannot be transmitted by saliva. Now let's go, back, let's go to how HIV and AIDS look like. So when somebody has HIV, what does it look like? And the question is, it has no look. I could be having it and looking very fine. You know, I look fresh. You know, I could be having it and nothing will show. So HIV infection doesn't have any look. So don't look for people who look a certain way and say that they have HIV. An infected person looks just like you and me because when they have their HIV AIDS, before their AIDS, sets in where they have symptoms. They don't look, I mean, nothing happens. The, the, the things, the infection, the breakdown, the spread is going down, the virus is working and multiplying in the person's system all right, but nothing shows, you know. Occasionally, sometimes when the person is, comes um, into contact with the virus, you know, it takes about 48 to 72 hours for the virus to be established in the person's system for us to see that, Yes, this person, if you test the person will have it, will test positive. That one, when that acute, we call that acute primary infection, they may have just maybe some body aches and a bit sneezing, a bit of sneezing, um, sore throat, slight cough, looks just like flu or a common kata, you know, but that one will pass very easily. And then it will go on, the, it will go silently multiplying for years before the age sets in. Now, when the age sets in, and what we have said is that AIDS sets in when the viruses and the multiplication have overcome your body's immune, the body's ability to protect itself. So that's when you see the weight loss. The weight loss really is towards the end because it's been going on for a long time. So there's persistent fever, you know, they get fever on and off, they are unwell. So frequently when you see them, they have been unwell and going around for a while, sometimes a year, two years, you know, it comes and goes and things like that. And then eventually they have the chronic diarrhea, nights where they have skin problems, skin infections will come, it will go. Um, things that other people get that is mild, they will get very, very serious illnesses from what we call common diseases, you know, because the, the body's immune system has no, I mean, the body's capacity to protect itself is virtually gone, you know. So it's only when they have AIDS that you see something. You know, but invariably they would have gone around, you know, typically in Ghana, they'd have treated for malaria, treated for typhoid, all kinds of things before the, the somebody will say, let's screen for HIV before you pick it up. So now we go to how we are fighting it. It's a global, it's a global pandemic, you know, and 
the key thing is to prevent. It is preventable. That's the first thing. It is preventable. So there are measures to prevent it. That's when we started talking about ABC, abstinence, you know, be safe, and then all those things, you know, safe sex, and use condoms, all those things that are preventive measures. And then active case finding and early detection, because we realize that when you pick it up early, so you see when the person has HIV, even before they get AIDS, when you test, you pick it up, you see. So that's early detection. And the earlier you pick it up, the better the outcome, you know, in terms of managing the person. So we encourage that get tested so that if it's there, it's picked up early. So that's what we call active case finding, encourage, you know your status, know your status, all those campaigns, you know, then there's treatment. So even though there's no cure, once the person starts having, whether it's skin disease, diarrhea, there are treatment for those things, to manage those things that have come about as a result of the body's inability to protect itself, but not to deal with the HIV itself, initially wasn't there not to take the virus out of the system. That one is still not there. We have psychosocial support. It is not easy telling somebody they have HIV AIDS. So my dear friends, it is not easy. So they need support, they need counseling, they need a lot of talking to. So that goes on for a long time. So that is also part of it. People need to, otherwise some people just give up, depressed and it will um, end up in all kinds of things. And once they are depressed, it doesn't help the outcome. So it's important that we have the psychosocial support from the clinic, from clinical psychologists, from family. Nutritional support. Nutrition is so key as part of the management, you know, and there have been other programs, you know, the PMT system for prevention of mother to child transmission. And it has been one of the most successful aspects of HIV, the, the fight against HIV, because initially we used to have a lot of mothers giving birth to children with HIV because they didn't know. But with this program, now is is very, very minimal. I mean, a whole year in our hospital, we hardly see cases, you know, mothers with HIV giving birth to um, HIV free children. Then a lot of things because most, the commonest form of transmission is sexual. And therefore, if people are encouraged to behave responsibly and safely regarding their reproductive health, it's one of the key preventive measures. Then there's what we call the post-exposure prophylaxis. So when somebody has been exposed to the virus, there's a 72 hour window where something can be done to prevent the, the virus from, let's see, establishing itself, you understand, in the person's system. And we particularly do this, especially for health workers, you know, or for sexual assault victims. So somebody has been raped immediately, you have to report so that this can be given to them so that they do not get HIV AIDS, things like that, post-exposure prophylaxis. Some people, um, so that's one of the key things in our um, program in this country. So a health worker is working with an HIV patient, they get um, pricked by the needle they were working with or some kind of exposure. They, we also have that um, 72 hour period, preferably 24 to 48 hours, but we can have up to 72 hours to prevent it. Then there are key population programs like men sleeping with men, commercial sex workers and things like that. So basically that is that about HIV. And then we know that the first HIV case was picked up in the, I think in 1983. In Ghana, the first case was in 1986. So in the early 80s and 90s, there was very little knowledge, you know, just like COVID in 2020 when there was very little knowledge and there was a lot of fear and a misconception about all that. And there was also delayed diagnosis because of the little knowledge, even healthcare workers wouldn't even suspect it and therefore go and test for it. And therefore people would be diagnosed in the late stages or they would come late, you know, having gone through to different places, some of them um, churches, all kinds of herbal. So they go round and round because they have been unwell for a long time. So there was a lot of late presentations where they come, they look like bones in a dress, you, you know, that kind of thing. So those were some of the typical things. There wasn't any specific treatment or cure. There was a lot of fear and panic. And because of the lack of knowledge too, there was a lot of stigma and discrimination, 
You know, I know a woman who was unwell, went to the hospital with her husband and the doctor told them this was a diagnosis. And when they left the hospital, the husband said, don't follow me home. That was the end of the marriage. That was the end. So there was a lot of stigma and, dis and discrimination. People suffered a lot. And, there, and because of all these things, there was poor prognosis. So really it was like, once you get the diagnosis of HIV, it was like just a matter of time, you know? So that time HIV really did look like a death sentence when you were told that you had HIV, you understand? But we have moved on over time. There's more knowledge, better understanding, you know? Like once again, comparing it with COVID, once we realized that this is something that there was a lot of um, resource and people coming together to find out, know more about it and see how best to, so there's, now there's more knowledge, better understanding, more skilled people, you know, including myself, <laughs> quicker diagnosis. So people are diagnosed much, much earlier than they would be. And then there are more effective drugs. So now we do not have drugs that remove the HIV from your system, but it stops the virus from multiplying because it's when they multiply that you cause damage, you know, and then we are targeting the key populations that are fueling the spread. So a lot has gone on. You know? And so these are some of the things we want to share a bit of global data, you know. So at the end of, by the, as at June 2021, 28.2 million people all over the world were on treatment for HIV, you know, out of the 37 million, 37.7 million that were living with HIV all over the world. And in 2020, you know, 1.5 million people got infected, new infections, 1.5 million people, and 680,000 people died from HIV, from AIDS-related illnesses, all in 2020. That's just um, a little over a year ago. And then 79.3 million people, so since the 80s, 79.3 million people have become infected with HIV. And out of that number, 36.3 million have died. That's 46% of the people who have been infected, you know, and those are huge numbers. And at the end of 2020, that's um, according to the UN AIDS, about 6.1 million people in the whole world were living with HIV without knowing it. They had it, but they didn't know it. But the good news is that new infections have been reduced by 52% since 1997. And since 2010, new infections have been reduced by 31%, you know, that is to the 1.5 million. In. So it's slowing down, it's there, but it's slowing down. And the number of people dying from AIDS related illnesses have also reduced by 64% since 2004. And since 2010, 47% reduction. All this is because of the new knowledge and the things that have been happening. Now in Ghana, we have 350,000 people, adults and children living with HIV AIDS. You know, 30,000 are children below 15 years. Women aged 15 and over, 220,000. Men, 100,000, you know, so more women than men. And then the children aged 0 to 14 years, 29,000 people. When you talk about the prevalence, this is something that we compare globally. Um, our prevalence is 1.7%. It went lower, it's come up higher, but we want to go below one. So we are still fighting it, you know. And coverage of ART. So the out of the 350,000 people who are HIV, because who have HIV, only 60% are on treatment, you see, because now everybody who has it should be on treatment. And the treatment is free, you know. So what is happening? Why are we not seeing the successes that we want to see? And it's due to a number of things. As I said, a lot of things have changed but many things still remain the same. There's still no cure. So HIV would still, people who test positive would still remain positive, even though there's um, 
research going on. We have the HIV cure research going on. Then it's also fueled by human behavior. So as long as people behave in risky ways, HIV would still be with us. Then in spite of all that has happened, there's still stigma and discrimination. Today, when people hear that you have HIV, their behavior changes, you know, so it's still there. And what that happens is that people hide, people hide from getting access to help. And in fact, there's an, unfortunately, the stigma and discrimination is not only in the general population, sometimes even in hospitals. We health workers who are supposed to be devoid of stigma and discrimination is still found amongst us. Then there's still inadequate funding because the services are free, uh, are free so much. Someone has to pay for it, you know. So there's still not enough money to do everything. And we, as one of the poorer countries, we still bear the brunt, you know, of the, of the condition. Now, what are the breakthroughs? What are the different things that have come up? In spite of all the things that remain the same, you know, access to quality care has improved significantly. There were times when people had to travel long distances to go and queue. In fact, in 2003, for instance, there were only two places, Atua Government Hospital and then eventually Kolebu. You know. So wherever you were, if you had HIV, you had to travel all the way and there were long queues. You know. But now you can get HIV access to family care in many, many places, everywhere, all over the country and all over the world, you know, it's available. And there are newer drugs. Research has brought newer drugs so that um, at first you have to take one drug, you have to take like four or five drugs three times a day. I mean, by the time you finish taking medications, you are full, you can't even eat, your stomach is full. But now you, we have what we call the fixed dose combinations. So you may take one tablet, but it's actually a combination of let's say two or three drugs. So people are taking maybe just one tablet in the evening at night before they sleep you know so there are newer drugs which are more effective they do the work better in preventing the disease from multiplying and spreading and like i said treatment is free the drug is free people don't have to pay for it and there's even also the prophylaxis where somebody who's exposed can can be given medication to prevent them from getting the disease there's also more knowledge at all levels, you know, at all levels, different categories of health workers, NGOs have all been trained to be able to provide education and all kinds of support. Then there's a lot of research, you know, there's a lot of research as well that has gone on, you know, to bring all kinds of things back towards vaccines and cure and all kinds of technologies to boost immune system and all those things. And the immune system, like I said, the immune system is one of the key areas that the HIV affects, you know, and the, what has been found from research is that the HIV, HIV affects, damages the body's immune system. And then one of the key components of the immune system is what we call the glutathione, you understand? And research has shown that when there's low glutathione, it promotes the expression of, so it gives the virus free range to multiply. And then it, when the glutathione is also low, when you have low glutathione levels, it also prevents the, impairs the immune system really, the cells that function to protect your immune system, they can't function properly because you have low levels of glutathione. So what is coming up really is that if you have any opportunity to increase your glutathione levels, grab it with both hands and legs, you understand? And that is one, one of the key things. Glutathione used to be something that has been available. You know, look at these pictures. Fine gentleman, but look at how disease will, will end up making you look like. But there's a way out, you know. There are all kinds of things available and glutathione availability and then the ribosine technology is one of the things and it's available in, this, in, in, the, in the country and all over the world, you understand, for people who have HIV and other viral infections to improve their immune system and have a better prognosis so that people who have HIV can live a better life 
They can look forward to having children without HIV. They can look forward to not spreading the HIV to their partners. They can look forward to living quality lives to fulfill their, their dreams and to leave legacies for their children. And I've seen it when mothers um, who are HIV positive, they are waiting for the results of their children. And when it comes and it's negative, it's such a relief, it's such a gift, you know, and therefore HIV patients can live longer. And therefore it needs not be a death sentence. HIV needs not be a death sentence because there's so much available now to all our patients. So my last word is that HIV needs not be a death sentence. You can have HIV and live long. You can have HIV, have children. You can have HIV, get married and your partner will not get it. You can have HIV and do amazing things and live a long life. But the key thing is get tested and live a healthy life. Thank you very much. Over to you, Doc. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hassan. I know some of us may probably have questions. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, kindly raise your hand and then you'll be allowed to ask your question or you can type it in the chat box. And then you can, because this, this is pure knowledge. Okay, this is knowledge that, so, you know, when, I, when this flyer went out, what somebody told me was, oh, HIV, is it still there? That's what a person said. <laughs> oh, HIV, is it still there? And I said, is there now when you look at the statistics as of 2020, 350,000 people in Ghana alone. Okay, okay, and if you look at the, the number of people that all over the world were having the, 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 the problem, you can see that is there. Is there now? Sometimes it looks like something is not there until you have it. It's like COVID-19. It's like COVID-19. You think that, oh, COVID-19 is gone. It's gone. We, you know, people are going to stadium and watch football. It's gone until you have it. When you are diagnosed and you are told you have it, I'm telling you, sometimes your entire world will just come crumbling like that. So it's important to be educating people. But uh, it, it, from what I have seen it, and what Doc has said, it's, you got to have a very strong immune system. And that is very, very important. At least you have to have strong immune system. And sometimes people have this idea that, oh, you've got to be promiscuous for you to have HIV. It's not true. We have seen that promiscuity is not the only means for which a person will get it. You can get it through things related to blood, things related to injections, things related to certain things. You can get it by other means, not just only sexual transmission. So it is important to have the knowledge and to build your immune system. And it's not just HIV, but other related sexually transmitted diseases. Okay? Hidden ones, hepatitis B, gonorrhea, syphilis, and other ones, hepatitis B is there. Okay? But once you build your immune system, some of these things help you to be able to go. So if you have a question, you can put it there and then we can now Look at that. Now, Doc, I have some question I want to really ask. So yeah. you indicated that there was mosquitoes do not spread HIV. Okay. Now, back in school, we learned something and I still didn't get it. So I want to ask. You have somebody who has been... So two people are seated. One is having HIV. The other does not have. A mosquito bites the one that has the HIV. And then the mosquito goes to immediately bite the other one who does not have the HIV. In fact, it doesn't bite the other person. But when it bit the first person, it is said that the, the HIV virus is so dangerous, so the mosquito should be dying. <laughs> so the other person uses his hand, while the mosquito is dying, didn't know, uses his hand to slap the mosquito. And apparently <laughs> has some sore in his hand. So the question is that, is this second person going to have HIV? <laughs> uh, um, yes, look, so the, when you look at what happens in the um, mosquitoes, when they bite or when they bite 
they suck the blood. It goes into the stomach, you know, and processes. But you see, the virus HIV, it needs certain specific cells to be able to attach itself. So it is not just a matter of um, being exposed, coming to any part of your body that can result in the establishment of the infection. You understand? Because there will be some processing of the blood in the mosquito's um, system that may probably destroy it. Okay. Uh -huh. So there are a lot of things that may go on. So it would not directly. And even when it comes to biting, when the mosquito bites you, the person who has HIV, it, it sucks the blood. When it goes to bite the next person, it doesn't spit out blood. What the mosquito does is that it's, it pushes out its saliva because there are some chemicals in its saliva that will prevent your blood from clotting so that it can suck it. So it is not what it took in from the other person that is coming out. Okay. It's not the same thing. Uh -huh. so, so it means that it is very, it's highly, highly impossible, likely that mosquito will spread it. So far, that is what research shows. So far, that is what research shows, yes. Okay, Ambrose has asked the question. He says that, um, which region in Ghana is leading in this? Um, I think Ashanti took over in terms of the prevalence. I think so, but I think so. I'm not too sure, but it was, it used to be um, Eastern then, but I think the last one, I think it was um, Ashanti. But now the, the, the challenge is that people, people I mean, people are so mobile. We move so quickly that we, 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 we should look at the country as one. And in fact, the whole world, because yeah. even the whole world is so small. You can wake up in one country, lunch in another country and sleep in a third, in fact, not a country, continent, you understand. So people are so mobile now that it is important that we look at it from that perspective as a whole and not in the smaller uh -huh. Because if you, can't, if you think that, oh, Accra, we are fine. People are living in Eastern, Central, and coming to work in Accra, you know. So, yes, that's, that's it. So, so someone sent this question. It says that if some people, a, a husband and a wife-to-be, are going to get married. And do they have to do HIV? Because it appears people are afraid to do it. <laughs> Um, it is not, I mean, these days, I think it's just doc, some churches insist that you do it, but it's all in the, in the direction that it's good to know. I mean, when it's there and you pick it up, it's good to know. Then again, like the first story I gave, the woman, the man didn't know he had, and throughout that short period of marriage, because he was having, I mean, he's married to the woman, they were having sex, the woman got it. And when the woman got pregnant, the child got it, you understand? And believe you me, when your child has HIV, it is not an easy thing. And are you so what I would say- The woman did not know. No, the woman didn't know. Okay, so it means if she had known, it would have been better. The child would have been saved off. Yes, so if they had done the HIV testing before they got married, the man would have known. And usually when we do that, we counsel them on, mm. how to, on how to live so that you can, and we have what we call the discordant couples. One has, the other one doesn't have. So you educate them. When it's time to have children, you monitor, we do that. You understand? So if the woman, if they, the man had known his status, then they would have been advised on what to do to prevent the woman to get it. So let me get this to prevent the woman from getting it. Time to have children. So couple, one has, one doesn't have, they can still go ahead and have sex? Yes. Especially, you see, when somebody has the HIV virus and they are put on the treatment, what we call the ART, they, it brings down the virus levels because the viruses are not able to multiply. 
So one of the key reasons why everybody is put on it, even though they, have, they don't have any symptoms is that it brings the virus level to a very, very, very low level. So even though they will test positive, their cap capacity to spread is very, 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 very low. Aha. Uh -huh. So that is why we say that if you are positive, we, you take the treatment, we monitor your viral load, it becomes very low, then your capacity for transmission becomes very, very low. So your wife can still, um, you can still have sex with your wife. Your wife will get pregnant. They have a baby and the baby will be negative. Even if the wife is the one who is positive, the baby can still be negative. Mm. Yes. You spoke about the 72 hour window. Can one say that the 72 hour window is a cure for HIV? Um, it's not a cure because you have to have the infection before you are cured. Mm. So this is a period where it's like that's what call it's a it's an opportunity. It's the period where the virus has got into the system and it is it takes that long for it to establish. And what I mean by that is that once it comes into let's say um, your cells, it has to attach to a particular cell, break down certain things, go through certain things, and then find itself into the appropriate areas where it can start multiplying. So that is that period that takes. Uh -huh. So if you are able to truncate, if you're able to block it that time, then the, the infection doesn't get established at all. So such a person, after even after three months, six months, so that's what we do. We test them immediately. You test them after three months, you test them after six months, and they are negative. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't say it's a cure. You can't say it's a cure because they never had the infection anyway. Okay. There's a, another question. It says that... Um, can any health personnel break the news of HIV infection to an individual in the absence of a clinical psychologist or counselor? If um, yes. yes. What well, steps? So yeah. Okay. So if yes, right. what are the steps for counseling at the individual? All right. So generally, um, it's not like I said, it's not an easy thing to do. So we have people, so it's not just any health worker. But there are people, other health workers, nurses, and people who work with HIV patients who are trained to do that. So not necessarily clinical psychologists. Uh -huh. So they come in along the line so that you, they, they, they will be able to advise them. But when it comes to the testing, so what usually happens is before you do the test, you have to know that this is what you are doing and this is why we are doing it. It helps to, to kind of break it, gradually prepare the person. So you tell them before you do the test, you tell them that this is what I'm going to do. These are the ways. It can go this way or that way. If it is negative, this is what happens. If it's positive, this is what happens. You know, so those are the things that you need to do because it's very, very important that they get to know that even if they are positive, there's still life after the diagnosis. And if they are negative, then you counsel them on how to continue being negative. Uh -huh. So the steps are there. And once they are positive, they and they are being managed, every time they come in, in the, into the hospital, you always take an opportunity to advise them or to counsel them because it's a lifelong decision. It's a lifelong thing that you have to continue encouraging them to, to, to take the right decisions concerning their lives. Because along the line, some of them become depressed. Mm. Doc, I know you've dealt with a lot of HIV patients, and some of them you've come into contact by giving them the ribosome technology over the over, over some time. I know, I know you're one of the experts in this for years. Now, what have you seen on the health structure of these patients that you know have have have, have, have undertaken or have taken this ribosome technology plan? Yes, like um, like I said. One of the challenges we had, and but it's going down, but it's still there, is that people go, go around, they're unwell, they go around and around and around, so they come fairly late. And by the time they come, their immune system has gone down. Because we have a way of measuring the, the immune system. You know, we call them CD4 cells. We have a way of the count, we have a way of measuring, and we also have a way of measuring the amount of viruses in a person's system. And usually they have higher, the, the amount of viruses and the lower the, the count of the immune system. 
the ill, the, the sicker the person is, you know. So when they come, one of the key things you want to do is to make sure that you find a way of building up the immune system in addition to taking the medication. Uh -huh. And so for the so for some of the patients that we have introduced it to, I mean they they are. I like how Anne says it, that there can be miracles, you know. So they, they take the, the, the ribosine. You, it's not to replace the HIV treatment, no. It's in addition to it because the, you use different strategies. The HIV drugs per se, they are supposed to prevent the viruses from multiplying, you know, because the body is continually fighting the infection, you know. So what the ribosine does, it, it supports the body's fight you know, reduces those oxidative stress that comes with fighting infections and all those things. So they do well. And um, some of them, I mean, some of them is dramatic and it's, it's a pleasant way. And when they, 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 they and I mean, some of them, they, they gain weight. In fact, there have been cases that after a while you don't even recognize them. And so they mention their names and say, oh dog, this is me, you know, <laughs> because they have changed. They have gained weight you know and so yes once the immune system is supported to be strong and they take their compliant amazing things can happen wonderful now last question is how long do you think a person who is taking care of himself can, can stay with hiv um so it varies for some people once they get the hiv infection, you know, so there's the HIV infection and the AIDS, you know, so the AIDS comes in when the immune system has been overwhelmed. So the strength of your immune system determines how long it takes before the AIDS sets in, really. So like the second story I give, for instance, woman had lived for over 10 years after her husband had died. And it was when she was in her 70s, that she developed AIDS, you see. So you can't give specific things. So it can be anything from a year to 10, 15 years, depending on the person's immune system. So the, one of the advantages of testing early is that once you test early and you find that, hey, you have HIV, you are positive, but the symptoms haven't started yet, then you find ways of boosting your immune system, ribosine, things like that. That means that then, the AIDS will not set in because you are looking after yourself. You are looking after, I mean, and it doesn't also mean that if um, once you are taking the ribos, you can live anyhow, you know, you look after yourself, safe sex, good nutrition. You know, one of the questions that we're asking was that, so if we both have HIV, does it mean that we need, we need condoms? We can put the condoms away. I mean, what we realized was that if you take the, um, if you are not on treatment and you think that, oh, I'm HIV positive, I'm H okay. So what we've noticed is that when you have a couple where one person is taking the treatment, the viral load is down, it goes down, but their, their partner is not taking the medication, but their viral load is high. Anytime they have sex, the one who has a low viral load is exposed to newer, I mean, receives a newer dose. So it's better that we say that if you are both positive, so use condoms, but when the viral load is low, comes down, and you want to have children, then you do without the condoms. You have your children and then you go back. It's just a protective measure to make sure that um, people have quality lives. Wow, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to join me thanking Dr. Gloria Asa, a health specialist in the university. Uh, one of the specialists when it comes to infectious disease, it's not just AIDS. It is several other infectious diseases. One of the experts, the head of the, of the School of uh, Public Health, and she has educated us on the power of, 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 of knowing this HIV and how to bodyguard ourselves against it. And even if a person has it, and never think that because you are so faithful to your partner, you will, you, you, you know, nothing will happen. Okay, like, like nothing happens until a person gets COVID-19. Let's continue to protect ourselves. Let's continue to build our immune system. Let's continue to prevent diseases until they are cured so that we'll be safe. I want to say thank you so much, Doc, for the 
this wonderful, wonderful delivery you've given to us. I also want to say thank you to all those who have been around, you have raised occasion, and we've been able to have this knowledge. I'm sure with this knowledge, you can tell somebody some, something when it comes to this HRV. Tomorrow, God willing, at seven o'clock, we'll be listening to some other intellectual masturbation on the kinetics of the mind, on the kinetics of the mind. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you all very much indeed for being on the program.